Today we're going to talk about Alan Holly Hearst's The Swimming Pool Library. Um, if you have been watching my videos, you know the history that I have with this book. Girl, it is a buddy read that me and Frenchie D came up with. Well, she introduced me to this novel and this author. She, um, that we, we talked, spoke about it in one of my videos back in April and we decided to read it in July. Girl, you know, my mind and my schedule is just all over the place but I finally finished reading the book back in mid-August. Nonetheless The Swimming Pool Library is a gay contemporary novel um, LGBTQ and any other uh, letters if you please but um, it, I thought it was a very good book. It was a very wonderful book. It was very interesting um, Allen Hollinghurst is to sum up my complete and total pleasure that I found in this book is that Allen Hollinghurst's writing sold me on everything because it contained just about every trope of gay literature and gay men stories that there is available however his writing just sold it all for me very poetic and has so much range with it and by range I mean to be a little bit more clear and specific that Alan Hollenhurst can write you a great passionate love sex scene and then on the other hand his range can stretch to just something just raw and uncut just nasty as hell and you still like oh boy you just write your damn book that's how you be feeling now one of the things I want to make super clear first and to just make sure that everybody understands this is that the swimming pool library it is to give you a quick reference it is a uh, post stone post stone wall but pre you know the explosion of the AIDS epidemic so that's it's between the somewhere I want to say it's between the mid 70s to early 80s um there were little hints within the novel that I could have calculated and put together on my own formulations that would have probably told me more specific about the year or the decade in which the book take place however I'm lazy and I just was just enjoying the book now the reason that I want to point that out in particular is for a very personal reason um a lot of times with gay contemporary fiction um you know I think that some authors think that it is synonymous to uh, bring up the conversations of AIDS and HIV with gay characters, you know, like that's automatically, you know, a lot that has to be spoken about. And now that's not me taking anything away from that conversation because I think that there's, you know, there's innumerable, I sound like Trina Braxton, but <laughs> numerous uh, values that you can find in those conversations, you know, to educate someone about that subject. However, like I said, I did find it refreshing to not have to go into those darker, more grittier areas of gay contemporary fiction but to make it ultra ultra clear I do think that there was some subtlety of that conversation later on in the book um, like I said it was very subtle it was very uh, undercurrent um, maybe it was just me who caught it um, Frenchie D I don't know if you caught it but um, it's very undercurrent current later on in the book it wasn't so much forward and spoken about and I think that um, for what it was that it was showing within within the time, it was sort of expressed as the sort of breaching of that subject within that time frame that you know the AIDS started to begin to explode within you know the the communities, the gay community. With that all of the way, let's go ahead and get into some of some of the aspects of the book that I really love. First, let's talk about the perspective. The book is told through two different perspectives, even though I'm holding up four fingers, two perspectives. It is primarily carried by the first person perspective of a gay young aristocratic male named William Beckett. Now William Beckett, girl, let me tell you right now, like I say, he's an aristocrat. Uh, he comes from a very wealthy and affluent family. Uh, his grandfather was this huge superhead, you know, girl, senator status. I don't know what the whole England thing is. You have to help me with parliament and all that stuff. You know, the, the branches of that. But, you know, anyway, William Beckett comes from this great, magnificent family. He has one of the top-notch pedigrees and educations. He can do literally whatever he wants to do. Um, the thing about that, additionally speaking, is that he is blonde hair and... Uh, fair haired and blue eyed and green eyed so that helps him even more and that's even further his advantage let's just be clear on that nonetheless the second narrative consists of a frame narrative of someone else's another character's story told through the journal journal entries that William you know explores as the story progresses um, he's this character is also a very essential character to the novel and his name is Lord Nackwich now how did the two of these guys come together you want to say let's go ahead and let you guys know that let's let you know the book opens with William Beckett cruising 
cruising for sex now let's go ahead and get this out the way girl what by cruising i don't mean he's on the disney cruise he's not on the disney cruise with you know beverly what has it beverly with the flamingo hats and the cha-cha skirts and the marachi band that's not what cruising means um for those who may not know i'm going to footnote this here cruising usually men means or is usually a term delegated to the gay community in which a person or an individual a male or a gay male is searching or trying to hook up for random sex but the point that i want to make and revert back to is that william beckett is cruising for sex inside of this public laboratory in this london park so it's filled with other gay men uh, the vast majority of them being white older men and to be clear or william beckett is not really finding anything to feed his fetish because he has a fetish for men of color Lucky for William Beckett, he does see a young Arabian man and that, you know, that catches his attention and of course he decides to go and pursue sex with this, this male. You know, cruising, it's all about the subtlety, the eye contact, the nudging, and I think as a 2015, it's a, it's a lot more direct than that, especially with apps and stuff on your phone, but you know, that's irrelevant. Unfortunately, while William Beckett is on the cruise for this young Arabian boy, he is stopped or halted in his steps by an incident involving an 83-year-old, the 83-year-old Lord Natwich, who enters the laboratory and suddenly decides to have a heart attack on the damn floor. William goes and resuscitates Lord Natwich, and you know the paramedics come, and Lord Natwich is taken on to you know his next destination for medical treatment. And William Beckett basically feels like a little hero. And, you know, from that point forward, he proceeds to do whatever the hell he wants to do, which would include returning back to his apartment where his boy toy, which is a black male, is living and causing him all kinds of hell and continue forward with some various forms of uh, other recreations. With all his little trivialities aside, William Beckett then goes to the Corinthians Club. I think it was called the Corinthians Club, but they shortened it for the quarry. Um, in that place, that's basically a gym. It's, you know, a gym featuring men or populated by men. Um, you know, it has the saunas, the bathrooms, not the bathrooms, but you know, the bathhouse rooms. Um, you know, there's the swimming pools. It's the gym, the shower rooms, and you know, where everybody's looking at each other's. Yeah, that. But anyway, William has an affinity for um, swimming, the swimming pool area. So after his long day, his long dreary day of, you know, random sex and brutal sex and all that stuff and, you know, popping pills and all that kind of shit, he decides to just relax it in his pool because he ain't got shit else to do. I'm sounding really bitter with this novel, ain't I? I know, right? But let me go, let me just stop. But anyway, as he's relaxing, he sees Lord Natwich sort of swimming in his direction. Um, the man, the old man, old elderly man, he's fine, he's okay. You know, William inquires about his health. And Lord Natwich and William, they decide to form this friendship. And it, it, it's a really good friendship because Lord Natwich, you know, being the elderly Lord that he is, he takes William into these circles that William has never experienced before. So as William and Lord Natwich, and for some reason I keep thinking I'm saying his name wrong and I'm pretty sure I am. But anyway, as their friendship progresses, Lord Natwich, you know, he decides to put out a request for William to write his biography. Um, before William decided, before William decided to get in sort of the lifestyle that he has now of, you know, just doing whatever the hell he wants to do, um, he was a writer uh, for this. I, th I believe he was a columnist of some sort. Lord Natwich knows that information about William, so that gave him the lead on to ask William to write, you know, to write his biography. Uh, William is very reluctant at first. It takes the help of his friend, who is a doctor, to sort of like, you know, push him and influence him to, you know, actually, you know, step out of his routine of, you know, the, the Corinthians Club and the Random Six, you know, to you know, put his focus into what he was really good at, which was writing. So eventually, William decides to accept Lord Natwich. I'm just going to call him Charles. His first name is Charles. That's much easier for me. Y'all know I'm slow. But anyway, eventually William decides to accept Charles's request to write his biography. Um, Charles then issues Will a stack of his journals and his diaries in which Will then produces to write that biography. While that is the backbone to this novel, the theme that it concludes to is something you probably will not uh, anticipate because I did not and that's keeping it as vague as possible without spoiling the book but let's just put it this way this book the backbone of this book that I just described to you it was all a conspiracy it was all a conspiracy 
other than that theme that I will not give away, but I think it's very important for you to explore for yourself. This book did play with, like I think I said earlier in this video, play with a lot of the stereotypes revolving around the gay community and gay um, literature. So one of the things is that William Beckett, he is not out to all of his family. Um, he subconsciously, I think he understands that it's going to be a problem if he did come out to everyone. Um, he is out to his, uh, his sister and his brother-in-law and also his nephew, which let me tell you right now, if you don't get anything from this novel, I think it would be very, very important for you to buy, buy this book just to read the scenes and the interactions, be interactions between William and his nephew. Also, it plays with the theme of, you know, the, the whole theme of, of sex, you know, in the gay community and that promiscuity that is often, you know, talked about and judged and that sort of thing. Um, there's, there, there, there that's a whole nother topic, but like I was saying, th although that is displayed in the novel, I think that the way, uh, Hollinghurst wrote it, how he expressed it through his characters was something that just took it to a whole nother level because it's not salaciously done despite the fact that he has a range when it comes to, like I said, to writing sex scenes. To me, the characters exploring that whole promiscuity of the gay community, it was much more um, explorative to the reader's perspective, you know, you know, with William visiting gay bar, uh, well, gay cinemas and girl going to these exhibition exhibitionalist uh, uh, functions and, and whatnot and all that sort of stuff. It was just really interesting how that all played out. So I think that um, while, like I said, the stereotypes were definitely there the way that uh, Hollinghurst wrote them, it, it just took it to this whole different level. So it, it wasn't campy, I want to say. And for me, I have a problem with those campy gay books like the one I was talking about before about the go-go dancer and LA. When it comes to the characters, I did like every last one of these characters to a degree, but I don't think any, like I said in one, one video, I don't think any of them quite learned what they were, what I figured they were supposed to sort of overcome within themselves. Um, instead, they sort of succumb to the, their, their impulses. But anyway, I think that's all I'm going to talk about with this book at this moment. Um, if you want more, you can definitely click on the link to my blog below. Um, that's where I actually have my written thoughts out, um, mostly revolving around the characters and these themes that i just spoken about. I just wanted to go ahead and just tell you guys a little bit about this, bo this book to express myself on the camera about how much I absolutely love the book that I had to buy another book by him. I thought it was behind me, but it's not. So if you ever get a chance, I would suggest you read The Swimming Pool Library by Allie Hollinghurst. Okay, so this book totally makes me want to sing this song. The song is Light Skin, Dark Skin. In my Asian persuasion, I got them all. That's why these girls out here hating. Yeah.